Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Unusual ability, sterling character, eloquent at the council fire, sagacious in planning campaigns, and fearless in warfare. For 50 years as chief of the Shoshones, he has held the confidence and love of his tribe. The memory of his love for his own people will linger to assist them in their troubles and he will never be forgotten so long as the mountains and streams of Wyoming, which were his home, bear his name. There's always been that reverence among people for him, no matter which group they come from. It's sometimes just referred to as the old man. History has many ways of remembering. The written word, the story by the campfire, the statue by the battlefield. The legacy of Washakie, the last chief of the Eastern Shoshone, is a place. The Wind River Indian Reservation, a vast tract of beautiful landscape that stretches from the rushing water of Wind River Canyon west around a broad fertile valley and up amidst blue alpine lakes to the peaks of the Continental Divide. After a life that spanned an entire century, this is where Washakie was buried. He had been a warrior, a leader, and a diplomat, and now he rested in the soil he had secured for his people. But his story began hundreds of miles away, in another high valley far to the north. Washakie, who would become a great chief of the Eastern Shoshone, was born among another tribe in the Bitterroot Mountains at the beginning of the 19th century. This was their homeland, you know, this is the place where they gathered our, all of their roots, the, all the plants, everything was here. His father was a member of the Salish tribe, known to some as the Flathead. His mother was a Lemai Shoshone of a band that fished for salmon in what is now Idaho. The Bitterroot Salish here used to travel over, over the mountain into the Lemai Shoshones. Uh, they were allies, you know, blood brothers. Nobody would make you as an outcast, you know, because you had a Shoshone wife. The Salish and the Shoshone of 200 years ago knew intimately the valleys and lakes and peaks of the northern Rockies. They knew where the buffalo were, where their enemies were, the spiritual places. They did not know where France was, but they had met French trappers. They did not know who the president was, though he ostensibly ruled even the unmapped country of the American West. They could not know what incredible changes lay ahead. The Shoshone homelands and the entire continent would be utterly changed in the century of Washakie's life. President Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark in 1804 to explore the Louisiana Purchase from St. Louis to the West Coast. They were followed by a flood of immigrants who marveled at the wild, promising world of the West. For the Americans already in the West, the Native Americans, 
the newcomers unsettled everything and made the world wild. When the white man came, they came from another world, another hemisphere that they lived in a long time. So they lived their way and we lived our way over here and they weren't the same. Well, when they came here, they brought their diseases with them. New diseases like smallpox from which few Indians had immunity. The introduction of the horse and the rifle and the beginning of the destructive harvest of wild game in the West. The tide of American empire, a great movement of immigrants, compressing the native tribes until they were fighting with each other and with the U.S. military. All in just a century, a collision of utterly different cultures vying for the land and the heart of a new nation. There are no surviving stories of Washakie's childhood among the Salish, but we know that as an Indian boy of that time, he would be an experienced hunter at an early age. He might have gone on a vision quest to gain strength and guidance. When they start walking, they're already getting their discipline. They're getting their discipline. Up to 10 years old, they were in the care of the mothers. After 10 years old, they become, you know, into the hands of their uncles or their their fathers to take, to, to train them. The Salish were a relatively peaceful people, but they found themselves fighting over hunting grounds and horses with the Blackfeet from the north. A skirmish with a band of Blackfeet set off a chain of events that would lead Washakie to the Shoshone. Him and his family, they was up that uh, way towards Montana and, uh, and they happened to run into the Blackfeet, and uh, they killed his dad. Young Washakie survived the attack. He said a man came to him. And he said um, when he got up, he told him he was going to be a leader. He said and the man disappeared. He said he had a bright light around him. He looked over this hill there, and there was some riders coming. He said, I could understand these people. He said, I could understand these men. They were speaking my mother's language, the leader. He said, I'm going to take him. He's going to help me. He's strong. He said, look at him. He's still standing. The boy found a new home among the Lemai Shoshone. The Lemai were one of many Shoshone bands throughout the West ranging from the deserts of Utah to California and north to Canada. All of the 24 different sh bands of Shoshone spoke the same language. The only difference in the language and speaking the language is the dialect. If communication became a problem, then there was also the Indian Sign Language. Washakie was fully accepted among the Lemai Shoshone and trained as a warrior and hunter. Young children are treated as adults if they wanted their child to be a war leader, they were spiritually trained to use the mind to endure pain. As a young man, he also ran with a Bannock band. The Bannocks shared the Snake River country with the Shoshone. The more aggressive young Bannocks sometimes raided immigrant travelers, and there are stories that Washakie participated that's where he really sharpened his skills was with the Bannocks as far as a warrior. Uh, you know, you're growing to adulthood and, and that. And so from that, I think the Bannocks were uh, uh, pretty, they liked to fight. And uh, the Shoshones, they, they would fight, you know, but, but the Bannocks seemed to do a lot more of it as the record, the history records will show. The first fight, I was a boy. There were eight in the party, all were on foot. We went until we found five lodges of Blackfeet. We crawled up and got their horses. We killed several Blackfeet. Washakie, 1893. It was during this period that he received the name we know today, Washakie. 
Uh, some people will say it's rawhide rattle to the big wind people or to the people in the, the, the area that I grew up. It actually was in reference to the scar. The Shoshone name for that rattle is Wisaki. The migrators that come in interpreted that Wisaki into a Washaki. <laughs> And right there is where they called him Washakie. He would have a rattle that he made from a buffalo. And uh, what he would do is when he would go into battle, he would shake it so that the, it would spook the horses. And they would think that it was a rattlesnake. But his destiny was to be a leader. And that would happen among the Eastern Shoshone in the Wind River Valley. The bands of Shoshone that would eventually unite under Washakie were skilled at survival in very difficult environments, from the dry basins of Utah to the big rivers of what is now Idaho. Some other tribes referred to them with a hand sign. The sign in the sign language of the Plains tribes for the Shoshone was the snake. That was a sign of respect for the Shoshone people but it also was an indication that Shoshone people were very capable of outmaneuvering other tribes. Archaeological digs suggest Shoshonean people inhabited the fringes of the Rocky Mountain Cordillera for thousands of years. The Shoshone language connects the tribe to the Indians of Central America, such as the ancient Aztecs. Among North American tribes, the Shoshone are related closely to the Paiutes and Utes of the Great Basin, and to the Comanche, who became one of the most powerful tribes in the American Southwest. It was from the Comanche, their relatives to the south, that the Shoshone first obtained Spanish horses, probably early in the 18th century. They didn't have words for horses. They called them uh, a big elk, shunka, big dog and uh, they changed the life of, of all the tribes, and it also made the Shoshone people uh, very strong in the field. The Shoshone became much more mobile traveling north to Canada, south to Mexico, and across the Rockies to reach the huge bison herds to the east. They became the most powerful tribe on the northern plains. When the Plains tribes acquired horses, their cultures flourished at an unimaginable rate because their lives were so simplified in so many ways where before they'd spent all their time hunting for survival on foot. During this brief period of glory and prosperity on the Plains in the 18th century, the distinct character of the Eastern Shoshone took shape. Now other, more powerful forces would begin closing in and a new kind of leadership would emerge. Another force from the east came, and this was the gun. Eventually, all the tribes got horses and all the tribes got guns. When that happened, uh, all of the forces, because of uh, the reputation of the Shoshones, the snakes, they allied and they began to push the snakes out of Canada, and they pushed them back down into Montana, into Wyoming. To politicians like Thomas Jefferson, the West offered space, a vast empty repository where you could send restless pioneers and Indian tribes from the East. But as more Indians were pushed West and more whites moved in, the pressure was immense. Indians struggled to figure out their new neighbors because their lives depended on it. They spoke a language few Indians understood. They were protected by the well-armed troops who seemed to think the land was theirs. Into this tumult stepped Washakie, a tall, striking figure whose broad experience prepared him as a new kind of leader for a new era in the West. His leadership was evident not just to the Shoshone, but to the non-Indians as well. He was a man born to command, having strength and dignity, 
endurance, and a countenance expressive of fine character and determination. Elizabeth Burt, Army Wife, 1865. Strangers saw these attractive qualities in Washakie at an early age. As a young man, after his time with the Lemai and Bannocks, he hooked up with white trappers. Washakie said in an interview in 1893 with Captain Patrick Henry Ray, who was the Indian agent, that he met Jim Bridger soon after Bridger made his entry into this country. That occurred in 1824. So we can probably assume that Washakie met Jim Bridger 1825-26, somewhere in there, which was the dates of the first rendezvous. Washakie's friendship with Bridger may have played a role in his rise to power among the Eastern Shoshone, proof he could communicate with the ever-increasing whites. Great leaders of a people come up through the ranks. In them days, you had, you, you had to have power. And to me, power comes in at least two forms. One is physical power, and you had to be strong, physically strong and brave. The other one is spiritual. And, and that is something within you. The important thing was how you related to your people and your relationship to the one above. So I think a combination of them things uh, makes for a leader. There's nothing that's hereditary about, about in our tribe. It's a matter of uh, people's choice of who they want to follow. A group of people are willing to follow you because you're able to make those decisions. It's earned, it's a, a title of respect. As far as skills, you know, you talk about some of those, being able to just meet the needs of the tribe by knowing where game is, or to set up a defense if, they, if they're attacked, or even to attack some of those that have come into the area. We know from Washakie's interview with uh, uh, Captain Ray that he went on at least seven raids. Uh, the first two or three, Washakie is a follower. Somebody else is leading these raids. By the third or fourth raid, um, Washki is the leader. So this demonstrates that he was following that Shoshone pattern of um, movement into prominence. Uh, he had, was noticed first as a young warrior, then gained some notoriety as a leader of raids. They wanted to put Washki through uh, certain ceremonies, so they cut their uh, fingers to make blood and. He marked uh, on his, the chief's body, and then the chief marked his on his. So they uh, become blood brothers. Washkey comes into the written record in the 1840s, and this is when Osborne Russell mentioned that Washkey was one of these rising young warriors who was well known for his prowess in battles against the Blackfeet. The village of the Snake Chief, Mawumha, already amounted to more than 300 lodges. And moreover, he was supported by the bravest men in the nation, among whom were Inkatosh Oyo, Bibibo Untuwazi, and Washaki, who were the pillars of the nation and at whose names the Blackfeet quaked in fear. Osborne Russell. The years that followed were a most difficult time for the Shoshone Indians. They were beset on all sides. White immigrants to the south, Blackfeet and Crow to the north, Sioux from the east, the Utes to the west, and now Mormons moving into Utah. With game diminishing, many tribes coveted the hunting grounds of the Wind River and Bighorn Basins. The Fort Laramie negotiations of 1851 were the first major attempt by the U.S. government to settle matters with the powerful Plains tribes, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Crow. It was Jim Bridger, Washakie's trapper friend, who convinced the Shoshone that they should be at this treaty meeting, too. The Shoshone hesitated before entering the open country of their enemies. There had been trouble with the Sioux only days before. When they finally did arrive, it was with a great show of strength. They were dressed in their best, riding fine war horses and made a grandly savage appearance. The chief alone a short distance in advance. 
A Sioux sprang upon his horse, bow and arrows in hand, and rushed towards Washakie. The chief moved a few steps farther and raised his gun ready to fire, just as the reckless Sioux was pulled from his horse and disarmed. The attitude of the snakes, the cool, deliberate action of the chief, the staunch firmness of his warriors, and the quiet demeanor of women and children, who were perfectly self-possessed. Percival Lowe, Dragoon. When I think about the things that my grandmother directly knew about what happened, she said, your grandfather said that he rode in. There was a lot of enemies there, but they didn't do anything. She said he was ready because this was where he wanted to live. She said, your grandfather took some of his men. They would go out and they'd practice a battle. He said everybody in the camp was real quiet. They knew something was coming up. Sometimes you would put on your, your best regalia if you weren't gonna come back. He wasn't afraid. None of his men were afraid. My chief would have killed him quick, and then them fool Sioux would have got their backs up, and there wouldn't have been enough room to camp around here for dead Sioux. It'll be a proud day for the snakes if any of these prairie tribes pitch into them, and they're not a bit afraid. Awful brave fellow, these snakes. Jim Bridger. When Washakie dealt with the whites in the 1840s and 50s, he dealt with the whites from a position of power. He regarded them as probably less than his equal because they were very weak out here on the plains and in the Rocky Mountains at that time. But when the treaty at Fort Laramie was signed, there was no mark of Washakie on it. The Wind River country belonged to the Crows. Washakie was in fact at his most powerful during the 1850s, despite the Army's attempt to undermine him. His people moved about in eastern Utah, the Fort Bridger area, the Green River country, and the Wind River Valley. The Shoshone every few years would continue a tradition that went back several generations of, of all the different bands from Oregon to Wyoming gathering in one place. And at this time, they would have a, a, like a supreme chief, I guess we would call them. And in 1856, according to some of the early historians, Washakie was that chief. The Crow controlled the northern end of the Wind River Valley, and there were fights between them and the Shoshone. The Battle of Two Hearts, or Crow Heart Butte as it's often known, took place about 1852 to 1857, as near as we can tell from the documentary sources, and based on oral traditions as well. The battle came about primarily because of federal meddling in Indian affairs, uh, namely the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1851. This treaty ignored the fact that the Shoshone sheep eaters had lived in the mountains of the Wind Rivers in the Yellowstone area for a long, long time, and that Chief Washakie Shoshones often traveled through the Wind River, hunted there, used it to get to other places. In a popular version of the Crow Heart Butte story, Washakie and big robbers settled the tribe's differences in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The image of the two warriors fighting atop Crow Heart Butte has become a Wild West legend. The real story is debated among historians, Crows, and Shoshone. As I was told when I was a little girl, was that the Battle of Crow Heart Butte did not actually happen at Crow Heart Butte. A group of crow hunters had come down and stole um, some horses from the Shoshone people at their camp. And uh, Chief Washakie and the Shoshones chased the crows as far as Mexican Pass where they recovered the horses. But while they were there, they did fight, and um, some crows were killed. And the ones that survived were sent back with half of their scalps intact as a message to the crow people that the Shoshones weren't to be messed with. When he challenged that crow chief, he said, I'm gonna cut your heart out and eat it. When that battle was over, he killed him and they said he held his heart on a lance after the battle and rode with it. I mean, my dad used to say that he did take his heart and my grandmother said he ate it, so between the two I'd say there's some truth to it. 
From this battle, everyone agrees, Washakie emerged with a Crow wife. To her descendants, that's indisputable. My great grandmother was a, was a Crow that Chief Washakie took. As, it was actually his last wife. Well, you, you have to take something, and women are always the best, unless it's a good horse. But the real struggle of the mid-19th century for the Shoshone, as well as other tribes on the plains and in the West, was for sustenance. The game that had sustained them for centuries had been wiped out in just a few devastating years. Game enough could not be found for Indians to subsist for one year. In my opinion, reservations should be made without delay. Jacob Forney, Superintendent of Indian Affairs, Utah Territory. Even Washakie, who consistently made overtures of peace toward the U.S. government, protested the impact of the settlers on the land and wildlife. This is my country and my people's country. My father lived here and he drank from this river. While our ponies grazed on these bottoms, our mothers gathered the dry wood from this land. The buffalo and elk came here to drink water and eat grass but now they've either been killed or driven back out of the land. The grass is all eaten off by the white man's horses and cattle, and the dry wood has been burned. And sometimes when our young men have been hunting and got tired and hungry, they have come to the white man's camp and have been ordered to get out. In his anger, Washakie made some threats but he repeatedly pressed Indian agents for a reservation. He wanted to live in peace. Wyoming at that time was the last best place, uh, the last largely unsettled region. And not only were the, was it Shoshone home territory and had been for hundreds of years, but now all these other tribes were trying to move into the area. The, the Sioux, especially as the largest and most powerful of those tribes, was overtly hostile. They were dedicated to driving the Shoshones back through South Pass into the Great Basin to eat crickets. With his large horse herd and his hold on valuable hunting lands, Washakie knew the Sioux coveted his wealth. But his band was caught largely by surprise in their camp along the Sweetwater River by a Sioux war party. In mid-June, of 1861, the Shoshones under Washakie were camped at the site we call Burnt Ranch today. At the time, it was a trading post called Gilbert Station at the last crossing of the Sweetwater. On the morning of June the 20th, uh, on one of the longest days of the year, the older women were, as usual, getting up early and beginning to light the cooking fires outside the teepees and, and prepare breakfast when as the sun was rising over the bluffs above camp, between 100 and 200 Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors appeared with the sun at their backs. And the Sioux thundered through the camp, in, weaving in between the teepees, and they were stealing all the tethered horses. There was a village under attack. The theft of horses was a major loss. But more devastating to Washakie was what happened to his oldest son, Nanagai. Nanagai rode into camp with his, the other warriors from, from Gilbert Station where they'd spent the night. Washakie berated this young man, uh, called him an old woman, said, what are you doing riding into camp after our enemies have attacked and fled? Why aren't you chasing them down out there? So Nanagai whipped his horse and charged out of camp and up the hill alone. According to one of the written records of people who, of the traders who witnessed the whole battle, it says he had a Colt's revolver in each hand and he shot down one Sioux on the one side and another Sioux on the other side before the remaining Sioux warriors crossed their lances in his body. And Washakie always felt that his hasty words had led Nanagai to ride out so impetuously. In addition to losing his son, for which he supposedly mourned four days and his hair turned white, his village was also now in mortal danger. Washakie, described as despondent, removed his band to Green River Lakes and waited. Indian agents, ever watchful and often wrong, tried to size up the situation. One of the misconceptions that uh the Euro-American tradition has about Indian leadership is that there was this military 
organization where one person had authority over all the rest of the members of the tribe or the band. Shoshone leadership takes place within the context of band or family affiliation. Um, if there are disagreements, it's okay for somebody to go elsewhere. The size of Washakie's band fluctuated. There were other Shoshone chiefs, like Peshigo and Bear Hunter, and aggressive Bannocks, who were drawing away young warriors from the aging chief. That was certainly the lowest point in Washakie's career, and they reeled, literally, back through South Pass, past Fort Bridger even, uh, clear down into the Salt Lake Valley until Washakie could begin to try and put some kind of, of uh, power structure back together. And that really didn't occur until January of 1863 at the Bear River Massacre. One of the worst massacres of the war against Native Americans occurred at Bear River. Responding to reports of raids by Shoshone Bannock bands along the Idaho-Utah border, Colonel Patrick Connor and the 3rd California Volunteers made a surprise attack on a Shoshone encampment along the Bear River. 200 Indians were killed, including women and children. Newspaper accounts never told the Indian story. The carnage presented in the ravine was horrible. Warrior piled on warrior, horses mangled and wounded in every conceivable form, with here and there a squaw and papoose who had been accidentally killed, San Francisco Bull. There was a woman, an elder woman, and she told her little grandson, let's go out there and lay among the dead, and maybe our lives will be spared. And from there they saw the entire massacre. The ice on the river was red. The snow was bright red with the blood of the Indian people. Subdued survivors of the massacre at Bear River rejoined Washakie's band. The chief had been right. A small tribe had no chance against the might of the U.S. military. It was time to negotiate. He wasn't going to be able to stop the movement of the whites. He understood that he needed to develop an alliance with the white people and with the military in order to secure the safety of his people. And you could see that in, in several of the other smaller tribes. Washakie thought they were in the same condition. So when they were uh, there and they saw this new mighty force coming, it numbered as many as leaves on the prairie, untold numbers of newcomers. So they made sure that they were allies with this new force because maybe they saw the writing on the, on the teepee. At Fort Bridger in 1863, the U.S. government offered the Shoshone a vast reservation, stretching from the Wind River Mountains north to the Snake River, south to Utah's Uinta Mountains, and west to some undefined border near the Great Salt Lake. This was not the sort of barren, unwanted tract from which reservations were usually made. So the 1863 treaty is, was... Uh, much larger, it, it, it encompassed uh, uh, a lot of things that, that uh, our tribe needed. The importance of these treaties to the government and to its citizens can only be appreciated by those who know the value of the Continental Telegraph and Overland Stage to the commercial and mercantile world, and to the safety and security which peace alone can provide to the emigrant trains and to the travel to the gold discoveries in the North, which exceed in richness any discoveries on this continent. James Duane Doty, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, 1863. The government's motives weren't purely generous. They saw a Shoshone reservation as a buffer to keep the aggressive Sioux and others from attacking emigrants as they headed west, stabilizing the region that connected the coasts of a country divided by civil war. But the huge Shoshone reservation was poorly defined, and five years later, another treaty council was held at Fort Bridger. There was all called to Fort Bridger to, to uh, talk about a treaty. They was given a chance to pick their reservation where they wanted to be, 
And they went round up, round in through Pinedale and through there and all that territory in there where there was that. Too much wind just went down into uh, Jackson. Too much snow. Then they went further on down where they always go for winter. Everything's there that we need, this in. So they picked this place here. Made a treaty for it. All the old fellas, their names is there. I want for my home the valley of the Wind River and lands on its tributaries as far east as the Papoja and want the privilege of going over the mountains to hunt where I please. Washakie. Chief Washakie chose this area because of the vast beauty, because of its vast abundance of wild game. And, you know, we have the water, which provided fish for the people and uh, an area for um, camps to be set up. Now our primary source of revenue is generated by the minerals of this land. In retrospect, Chief Washakie is still looking out for the people here on the reservation. He and his council members got to choose the reservation, so they chose a land that they knew well and was rich in natural resources. I see the 1868 treaty as another attempt on the part of Washakie not only to secure one of the last remaining refuges of the buffalo and a food supply, which he knew, but also the government must have felt very good about moving the Shoshone and other people away from the critical passage through southern Wyoming. The idea of moving them into the Wind River Territory was that that became the perfect place for a reservation. So here, government and Shoshone interests coincided. Washakie again showed his skill at negotiations. In the second treaty, he demanded military assistance, food and clothing, and firm boundaries defining a three million acre reservation that included the Wind River Valley. It also encompassed South Pass, where the Oregon Trail passed through, and the high Wind River Mountain country with its hundreds of lakes and herds of elk and deer. Washakie is often quoted speaking with the confident air of an absolute leader. His command seemed to come naturally. But what sort of man was he when he stood beside you and spoke with you and showed his feelings? These are hard things to know across the gulf of history. My grandfather is the son of Chief Washakie. My grandmother that raised me was the daughter-in-law of Chief Washakie, and she took care of him to the last days of his life. The thing that I always thought about that grandmother told me was he had a good spirit about him and he prayed. He was able to lead his people because of his spirituality, because he believed in the Creator. The man that took him when he was a boy was the same way. He was the one that was given the Shoshone Sundance now, Ohamagwea. So Chief Washakie knew about the Sundance, and he sang. He carried a pipe all the time. He went to a medicine wheel first, and he prayed and got his directions where to go, to go down and uh, get a one of those stones you fix pipe out of. It is known that uh, they use it for prayers, and the older Indians, they believed in it that way, to get connections with that great spirit. He seemed quite capable of irony and sly humor. When a group of Mormons suggested that they would like to take young Shoshone women as brides, Washakie thought a moment. Then he said, fine, and we will be over to your camp to select women for ourselves. In 1874, a young school teacher named James Patton 
accompanied Washakie on a hunting trip in the Owl Creek Mountains. There, among his people, we find a man well into his seventies, still full of vigor and vitality. Huge fires were burning throughout the camp. Harangues were made by the old men, incantations made by medicine men, drums were beaten, and rattle shaken. Washakie himself seemed on this wild and weird camping ground like another being. His voice, loud and clear, rang out on the night air as he addressed his people. His face lighted up and caused great enthusiasm among the young and the old as they joined in singing their old war hunting songs and the drums beat louder as one and then another of the old men took the speech, enumerating a victory here and there over their enemies, their own bravery, and their success on the hunt. James Patton, school teacher, 1874. That would be one of Washakie's last hunts. The bison, already wiped out in most of the West, would soon be gone from the Wind River and Bighorn Basin, too the era of reservation life had begun. An experiment in which neither the U.S. government nor the tribes knew what to expect. For the Eastern Shoshone, the adjustment from their old nomadic life to a settled community was difficult. They hung back near Fort Bridger at first, fearing that they would be attacked by their enemies if they settled permanently at Wind River. After the Treaty of 1868, you know, uh, it took them a couple of years to actually move over here, and, and uh, the expectation was that, that they would move here and the United States would guarantee a physician, you know, for medical purposes, uh, education for their children, food, things that they needed and, uh, and that they would actually learn to become farmers. Those were the expectations, that they would be protected from attacks. The enormous Sioux tribe often allied itself with Cheyenne and Arapaho warriors. In a sense, the Shoshone's relationship with the U.S. Army was a similar alliance for mutual defense. But often in the early years on the reservation, the tribe had to take care of itself. Washakie and his war chiefs were up to the task when the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho attacked at Trout Creek. They had a little block house over there where they could put the uh, uh, government and military dependents, you know, wives and children, but, but the, really there was no place to put the women and children of the Shoshone tribes, and what they did was they actually took them west up, up Trout Creek and hit them, and uh, because they had advance notice on that battle, they was able to set their teepees up along a, a ridge and uh, actually dig down inside the teepees and set the teepees up high where you can see out of them. There was warriors with rifles and bows and they were inside those teepees down, dug down, much like you would probably dig a foxhole and then they were able to shoot out from under those uh, teepees and, and uh, kill quite a few. What they didn't kill, they, they chased towards Casper. Shoshone warriors sometimes accompanied U.S. Army troops in campaigns to subdue tribes that were traditional Shoshone enemies. Even Washakie, now in his 70s, sometimes went, riding with General George Crook in his campaign against the Sioux. The Shoshone say that if the generals had listened to Washakie, Custer's death at Little Bighorn would never have happened. That's what uh, was told to me, you know, that they joined up with the armies to uh, see they had uh, enemies too. That to straighten things out, they got helping each other. They fought the Sioux, you know, Sioux and Cheyennes and Rapples. Sometimes the battles were close to home. In June of 1874, Troops under Captain Alfred Bates set out from Camp Brown after an Arapaho hunting party, though there was no evidence that they were to blame for any attacks. These were Shoshone enemies, though, so Washakie and his warriors accompanied the troops as they traveled at night to the Owl Creek Mountains. We had several boggy alkali creeks to cross and deep arroyos, ravines, high sandy ridges, and infernal sagebrush deserts 
found the terrain treacherous and taxing. Flowing hair and the swarthy countenances of the Shoshones mingled with the eager faces and courtly uniforms of the officers. Dr. Thomas McGee. In early morning, the troops and warriors came over a ridge above the sleeping Arapaho camp. The battle was hand to hand with heavy losses for the Arapaho, who retreated to a plateau above the camp and fired down on the attackers. When Lieutenant Young fell, Washiki and his men held the line. And when it was impossible, owing to a concentration of the enemy to hold the point longer, Washiki ordered the noted scout Cosgrove to carry Lieutenant Young off and slowly retreated behind the lieutenant under a desperate fire. James Irwin, Indian agent. Four years later, in 1878, about 600 Arapaho would arrive, starving and cold, at the Shoshone Reservation. They had suffered losses and hunger, and promises of an Arapaho reservation had been made and broken. The Arapaho people arrived here on the reservation, destitute, hungry, and they had no place else to go. And when the government put them here on the reservation with the Shoshone people, Chief Washakie said yes, you know, they may stay for one winter. Nevertheless, the government intended it to be permanent um, and never made that plain to the Shoshones or the Arapahoes. The Shoshones, although they are opposed to it and look upon it as an encroachment on their rights, yet will make no great objections. Washaki and the headmen, though they dislike bitterly to divide their property with other bands, have two great hearts to say no. James A. Patton, Indian agent. You know, as I was told by my grandmother, even though we're two separate people, or we're two separate in, uh, tribes, we're still Indian people. And she would tell me, Dama Nawandas, Oyondas, we are as one. The Arapaho would never leave the Wind River Indian Reservation. It was one of many promises made and broken to both the Shoshone and the Arapaho. To this day, people still argue about what is right and wrong about reservations. But in Washakie's time, what was wrong was quite evident. The tribes had exchanged their freedom and their claims on the traditional lands in exchange for their own inviolate piece of property and government support to help them get started. The efforts of tribal members were stymied when annuities were cut or farm implements failed to arrive. Farming on the Wind River Reservation is a dicey proposition for anybody, um, not to mention Indians who had basically no background in farming. They were hunting culture. The government expected the Shoshones to farm, but they never supplied them with, with what they really needed to make that successful, and that was water. He never dreamed in his wildest nightmares that the whites would come in and literally take over everything. By the late 1800s, his people would be enduring a, a one in three mortality rate. The white man kills our game, captures our furs, and sometimes feeds his herds upon our meadows. And your great and mighty government does not protect us in our rights. It leaves us without the promised seed, without tools for cultivating the land, without food we still lack, without the schools we need so much for our children. I again say, the government does not keep its word. At the very time the Shoshone were signing the 1868 treaty, a gold rush was developing in the high country around South Pass. The miners were digging within the reservation boundaries. So the government sent Felix Bruneau, a veteran negotiator with tribes, to see if the Shoshone would give up the land in exchange for some acreage to the north. The government thinks that exchange is fair. If the Indians do not think it fair, it is for them to say so. I have two hearts about it. This land is good. There is plenty of grass, berries, prairie squirrels, and fish. That 
in the north is poor, and I think it belongs to the crows. Suppose you give the president that land, and the president gives you $5,000 worth of cattle every year for five years. The Shoshone gave up 700,000 acres in the negotiations with Bruneau. Though Washakie recognized the value of resources like gold, he could see dangerous conflicts looming with miners in the South Pass area. Peace was the path that he and the other Shoshone leaders had chosen. Washakie does confer with his council members to pursue the best policy. Um, it looks like he has absolute authority but he's doing the same thing he did all along, which is use his advisors to help him decide the best course of action for his people. I think that's one of the, the main qualities of a leader is the ability to work with other people and to compromise. After 1885, um, Shoshone wealth declined rapidly. Um, this happened because buffalo had been killed off it also happened because where there were good hunting and game lands, now white ranchers spread their hundreds of thousands of cattle into the areas uh, which uh, destroyed the resources available for wild game. There was also something called the Panic of 1893, which was the most severe re recession, depression the United States had ever experienced up to that point. And budgets to Indian agencies were cut severely. Uh, all in all, this contributed to a massive poverty um, of all Indian tribes, not just the Shoshones. Once again, the federal negotiators came around to parley for a chunk of the reservation. This time, in 1896, speculators were interested in the eastern side of the reservation, particularly a huge hot spring that flowed into the Bighorn River. U.S. Indian inspector James McLaughlin offered the Shoshone and Arapaho $60,000 for the hot spring and 10 square miles of land around it. Major McLaughlin evidently had his instructions as to what he should do. At the same time, the treaty was not entirely satisfactory to me. I thought that the amount paid was absurdly low for the finest hot spring on earth. Colonel Richard Wilson, 1896. But Washakie's focus was not on monetary value. It was on the survival of his people. I used to go to the hot springs on the Owl Creek when the game and buffalo were there. When buffalo were plenty, I wintered there. Now I have moved away. I was afraid to stay there when there was nothing to eat. My friends that spoke for and secured this land are all dead and gone. I am the only one of the old men of my people left. Wilson was one of many military men who had the greatest respect for the old Shoshone chief. That respect went all the way to the top. President Ulysses S. Grant, something of a warrior himself during the Civil War, sent Washakie a silver-trimmed saddle as a gift in 1876. Asked by an Indian agent for a reply to take back to the president, Washakie was silent. Only after some prodding did he speak. When a favor is shown a white man, he feels it in his head and his tongue speaks. When kindness is shown to an Indian, he feels it in his heart. His heart has no tongue. Washakie, 1876. Washakie was an old man now. The life he had been born to, following the cycles of the seasons, was long gone. Skirmishes, battles, and wars had been won and lost. His people were around him in the warm valley. He had the respect of presidents, but he stayed close to his family. And he lived to be old. A lot of times, good people live to be old to be good seeds, that's what they're, they're here for, uh, be examples. To the end, the old man lived a robust, unpretentious life. He made visits around the reservation, often riding his horse. 
In February 1900, his health took a turn for the worse. He had been having difficulty eating and finally could no longer rise from his bed. He had last words with his friends and family. Before he died, he said, I brought you here to this land. It's beautiful. This is where I like to live, and this is where I brought my people. We lived a good life here. I want to say a few words to my children and family. I want you to open your ears and heart so you will know what I am saying to you. It has always been my hope to keep peace and harmony. I have never permitted a disgraceful depredation by my people when it was possible for me to prevent it. It is my earnest prayer that you, my children, will follow the footsteps which I have made for you and you will always be highly respected by our people and the white people. I'm not telling this to one of you, but to all. He was buried with full military honors at the cemetery in Fort Washakie, where he lies today. <laughs>